I'm the Reverend Dr. David Breeden, and as parish minister for Minnesota Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, it was my pleasure to interview these insightful, industrious, and dedicated founders who contributed years of work toward this healthy community. I invite you to sit back and enjoy the revelations and experiences of these strong Unitarian Universalist Fellowship pioneers who had a dream and helped to bring that dream to fruition. Here now, recalling how it all began and their part in the creation of Minnesota Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship are Betty Gutman, Alan Helen Hyman, and Luella and Red Newstrom. I'm very happy with the way things are going. I think our members are marvelous. I think it's very nice to uh, listen to a church service and see the trees outside and listen to Sonia's music. It's very nice, very enjoyable. Freedom to decide for themselves. That's the thing I like the best part. If I was ever going to join anything, <laughs> It would be this church. And it started at the First Universalist Church. You know, we, the group of us who started it came from that church. And they were having a lot of trouble with overcrowding, particularly in the Sunday school. They used to have classes in the kitchen and every other place. And so they had a great big meeting <clears throat> to decide what to do. And various things were decided. John Cummins, who I think had the best foresight, wanted to buy property in Eden Prairie and build a big church. And the people in Minneapolis said, no, we're a Minneapolis church, we want to stay in Minneapolis. So after a lot of fooling around, they came up with this brilliant idea that they would encourage the growth of fellowships, hmm. which meant that they took somebody from the eighth grade, somebody from the sixth grade, here and there, you know, no, no big deal as far as cutting out the size of the church or the, or the Sunday school. And Al Hyman was there and he sparked us. And he took us all into the, um, the library and we had an initial meeting and decided we would be a fellowship. The laborious process uh, getting the fellowship started, we had only a small number, as you can imagine, about six couples who really started this. We were plenty satisfied at First Universalist, but he convinced us that that was our mission. So uh, the nucleus was the Hymans, the Gutmans, the Newstroms. We only had 24 people on our list, and the UUA would not recognize us unless we had 25. So I said, Red, you got to join the church. And he said, oh. You don't want to join the church, is it just in name only? But I always obeyed your request. <laughs> oh. We should inject that, you All see. Right. Yeah. But then you also uh -huh. said, okay, I'll sign, but I'm not going to come to church. Yeah. But his money comes to church and has for all these years. <laughs> That's the beginning. On May 13th in 1965, First Universalist Church, where we most of us belonged, uh, had its annual meeting, and John Cummins was hoping to spread the word out west to the wealthier communities. And the congregation turned him down and said, what would be a good idea would be to start a new fellowship. So uh, after that meeting, about 12 of us got together with John, and we decided we'd start working for a church, even though we were not excited about that. We love First Universals. So October 3rd, 1965, we had a meeting and we called that the South Suburban UU Fellowship. And we met at the Richfield State Bank. Uh, on February 20th, 1966, uh, we had our bylaws adopted and it was signed by 27 members. We had already grown. Al did most of it. But uh, he really uh, was uh, very active and uh, very strong on uh, having a fellowship that would have a connection with the UUA. Uh, some people would have just liked to have had a fellowship that uh, where we just meet Sundays and that would be it. But uh, Al went to the trouble of finding out the procedure and uh, yeah, getting the, 
fellowship incorporated and uh, finding out the, how to do the charter and the bylaws. And he, he financed the legal fees for that too. So uh, that was pretty much how it got started. Going back just a step, the Universalist Church uh, was faced with a problem of overcrowding uh, in their particular facility. And at their annual meeting, uh, this became an issue which was rather hotly debated by the group that attended. And three options were sort of placed on the table. One was to go out and uh, purchase a, a new facility or create one. A second option was to try to expand the existing facility. And uh, the third option, which uh, sort of tagged along, uh, was, well, perhaps we can encourage the growth of a budding fellowship and thus relieve the pressure on the member and the uh, facility. hundred dollars. So very old hymn books that had been superseded, a table, which I could show you if we went down to the Sunday school, and some chairs for the Sunday school. That was it. They had gotten some kind of a grant, some kind of a gift from the denomination of a hundred dollars for something that they had done, so they gave it to us. Sure. Well, we were terribly committed, all of us. And actually, this got to be almost our entire life, our social life as well as, you know, a place to go to church. That was it. We were going to do something new and different. We were going to build this fellowship. It was a big fellowship movement at one point, and I think we were a part of that. And they saw this as the way to grow churches. I mean, we were supposed to, particularly after we got this minister on loan, we were supposed to become a church and not call ourselves a fellowship, for heaven's sakes. I think they're worried about that. I, I myself would not care. I would rather be, a, come a, be named a church so that uh, people who come here don't wonder why you're a fellowship. It's, it seemed to be an appropriate terminology. We were basically straddling the river. We were pulling people from Burnsville, Egan, as well as from Bloomington. So it's the Minnesota Valley. Mitt Luella suggested that name. We started out South Suburban, and that's... Uh, it sounded like a sort of a mall. <laughs> South <laughs> Suburban <laughs> Fellowship. Yeah, I can remember when we were meeting in a uh, couple of meeting rooms at the Holiday Inn up at 494 in Normandale, and uh, we were having attendance in the neighborhood of about, after we'd had 80 members, we were down to attendance of about 15 or 20. It was pretty mm -hmm. tight. That wasn't the worst. The worst was um, the minister that we got. And so we had an annual meeting, and of course this came up for discussion, were we going to keep her or what we were going to do? And there was a young woman, Sue, well, she lived in Burnsville. She was very upset at this whole thing, and she suggested that we disband the meeting, which wasn't going anywhere, and have a meeting of discussion, and then we restart the meeting. And we got <coughs> somebody who was a member at the time. He was a wonderful guy, a huge black man who was a psychiatrist. Anyway, he spent, we spent an afternoon working this out, and he was so skilled at, you know, that sort of thing, that it worked out. And I, I still remember that after we had started the meeting again, um, Somebody made a motion that we continue her, and we turned it down. It so came out okay. The place didn't fall apart. Um, not all that many people left. Some did. They went to the Dakota group, which was just starting at that time, but not very many. And um, 
we continued on and we did okay. Eventually came across this location thanks to Betty Gutman and she's a major factor in helping to get this particular location and in uh, getting it going. I sort of began to recess somewhat from leadership role. Uh, when we first moved in, the minister lived in this section of the church. Uh, that was the Baptist minister. And then we took that over and used it as part of our uh, functions. Uh, we had a lot of equipment to buy. We had to repair the building, pay the mortgage, and we had been living out of a trunk up until then. So we had a lot of space. You that should have seen this place when we first acquired it. Um, in the first place, it was a Baptist church that had disbanded <clears throat> and joined with another Baptist church, so the building was unoccupied. And they let us come in and rent it uh, for the remainder of the year until we got around to buying it. So we had these big painting sessions and everybody was here. Everybody painted, everybody cleaned, everybody did everything. On that, I remember sitting there at this meeting and Clay Wallen was there. And he was talking about this wonderful church he had been to where you come in and you smell the fireplace burning and so forth and so on. He said, somebody gave $50,000 to build this church. And I said, well, Clay, would you give us $50,000? And he said, yes. <laughs> and he did. He gave, he's got a plaque around here. He was the biggest donor, and he got us started. And then we had, you know, we had a capital campaign that Kathy Park ran, and, and all, I mean, we really scrounged for money. Oof. This was terrible. And we had an architect. Um, and I think he did a wonderful job with a lot of help from um, George Fairman, who was an engineer and who was chairman of the building committee. And he worked very closely with the architect and with the city and with the people who did it. And um, a lot of these ideas were his. He's very skilled at this. I didn't always agree with him, though. I very much objected to having the entrance on the back of the building, for example. I thought this was not a good approach for people coming, but he persuaded me this was the way to go. So. And at some point you say to yourself, well, it's okay, it's going to be a good building. I don't have to have it my way, necessarily. But I think he did, it came out just wonderfully. I had to love it. We had that going upon inception of our beginning services at the Fort Snelling Chapel. We had, we had about 20 people, 10 of whom were committee chairs. <laughs> you know? And uh, the person who had the RE uh, program structured it, set it up for the number of kids we had. We only had about a couple of dozen at the initial time. And, uh, that started to work. And by the time the year was out and we were at the Masonic Hall, uh, we had, as I say, about 60 kids. We had a range of classes uh, and we had instructors in each one and a curriculum. I didn't realize that I wanted to be a teacher until I taught a class in Sunday school with Mike Gutman in it and it was called Beginnings about human beginnings. It's a wonderful book. Mm. And I was so totally prepared for that class. <laughs> uh, I just loved it. And he did too. He went right home, told his mother he wanted to go to the library and get that book. <laughs> so mm. that was fun to have kids care that much about mm. what was happening. I know one of my proudest moments was when um, The, tra the Traubs. Their boy was in high school and finishing, and they, we had a high school session, and they spoke, the boy, the children spoke. And he told what this fellowship meant to him, and it was wonderful. It gave him his whole point of view of living, mm -hmm. and um, it was so inspirational. And I thought, if we have done that for somebody, we've done something wonderful. I was usually conducting uh, the service and uh, we'd have the typical 
readings, we have some hymns. Uh, I made it a point to bring in recorded music, and these are mostly uh, 60s types of uh, popular tunes, uh, which were rather radical to most people at the time. Uh, we usually had our speaker and then conversation with the speaker afterwards, and that was it. We have tremendous resources in this area. We should be tapping into them. And I think part of the function of this congregation is not only to purvey a series of liberal ideas, but to broaden the, uh, if you will, awareness of the congregation of the various cultural aspects of our society. They're all controversial, and if they aren't, why we ask questions so that they are? <laughs> Without depreciating uh, our current minister, uh, the attitude was that, number one, we couldn't have afforded a minister if we wanted one, but, and that was a very practical condition. And so therefore, it had to be a matter of the members of the fellowship providing the necessary leadership and direction. And for a long period of time, there was some question in the minds of some of the members as to whether a minister was an absolute necessity. But it obviously became uh, a necessity as we began to think about growing. Uh, there were some people who just wanted to keep things very small, localized, uh, maybe under 100 members or even less. And then there were others who felt that, you know, we just couldn't sit on a franchise, so to speak, and uh, had to go out and do something. And so eventually, uh, having a minister became a factor in that growth. Have you listened to um, Frank Dreisbach? You know, he's been coming here for about 30 years. He and, um, well, Bill Johnson, who was, he's another person who came, Bill Johnson. His wife was a Catholic. <clears throat> she made a big mistake of dying during GA. This is something you must never do. <laughs> because we, she, what they used to do is go first to her church and then come here. So when Rose died, we tried, looked for a minister, and all the ministers were at GA. But we found a Catholic priest, and somewhere or other, somebody came up with, with a UU. I don't know who he was. I can't remember now even who he was. Anyway, um, Bill Johnson had gone to a talk, and he sat beside a very interesting man who asked interesting questions, and this was Frank Dreisbach. So he told Frank about our group, and would Frank like to come and speak? He's come at least once a year ever since. Or, who joined the fellowship very early, and, uh, but not early enough to be charter members or to be founding members, but who were very active and made a very large contribution. Uh, Jane and Bill Parrish, and uh, they're both very, you know, getting along in years, and Jane is not well anymore. But she was our artist, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the head on our uh, newsletter, she designed that, and, uh, several other things. She designed the uh, cover of the directory, not the one we currently have, but uh, for many years. It's a uh, drawing of the church building before it was enlarged. Ellie Morton was a part-time administrator and uh, director of religious education. And we took a wonderful trip down Minnehaha Creek, which is permanent in my memory because Emil Goodmanson was district director at that time and he joined our fellowship, partly I suppose to keep an eye on us, and his wife Barbara came along with him. Barbara is not a slim person and she and Don Park, who Don Park was even more slim than he is now, they were in a canoe 
They got in that canoe and it immediately turned over and they were sopping wet. So we all were very anxious about them, although the water was about this deep. Well, they got in again and bingo, over they went again. And that was the highlight of the trip. But it was a wonderful trip down Minnehaha Creek. It was one of our goals, but I think we've only accomplished it recently. Um, one of our goals always was to have more impact in the community and with other churches. And I think only in this area of social justice, for example, and I think we have to give credit to Monica Williams for that, that we have managed to um, have some kind of relationship with other churches. Uh, I thought it was wonderful when that man from Oak Grove Presbyterian came. And, but we have always been interested in social action. Well, I would join this fellowship because uh, people are very friendly. We have a reputation of being friendly. They are very friendly and it's a church where you can think what you like and be a member. And that, that's wonderful freedom. Some people don't want it. <laughs> I'm just glad to see it, uh, if you will, moving along. I won't say prospering because finances are always a problem, but uh, I think it's doing well. It's become established in the community. I think we uh, we have a lot to offer people. That's a bias, of course, but 